The product team mission is really to enable you guys to solve problems uh, that you know how to solve, right? Decisions was started, uh, it was started by Carl and me when we left Semantic, and we always had the kind of same perspective. We love to build software, uh, but we don't, you know, we're not that good at, at knowing other businesses. We're not good at healthcare. We're not good at financial services. I'm going to speak for myself, uh, not for anybody else on the team. But, you know, you do. And making it possible for the people who know what needs to be done in software has always been the core of our mission. I love to talk about the game of telephone you play in third grade, right, where you whisper a message around the lunch table and it comes out completely distorted. Somebody asks to trade pudding with another kid and the last kid is forming an army to invade a, a sovereign nation, right? It's ridiculous how distorted messages get when we pass them from person to person. Our biases get injected, our own perspective gets injected. And yet that's how most software is built. Right, the chain of people from subject matter expert to business analyst uh, to you know, somebody who's gonna produce functional requirements, that gets handed off to a project manager who then hands that off to developers and delegates all the tasks. The developers give that to QA. QA does a bunch of testing. They hand it maybe back to the business analyst who checks off that the requirements were met. You hand it back to the subject matter expert and the subject matter expert says, this is not at all what I wanted. There's a hundred thousand memes of that process on the internet. You should go look up and laugh to yourself all day. Our mission has always been to allow people who know what rules matter, getting a patient into a particular bed in a hospital or getting a loan approved, right? Uh, getting a bill paid, letting the people who know how to do that be more directly connected to and involved in the development of that software. That mission hasn't changed. The last couple of years, we've spent a lot of time moving to React, uh, trying to make the front end more responsive, trying to give you guys better tools to work in to do that, to accomplish that mission. Uh, we've worked on a number of deployment topologies in order to make decisions more flexible in the way that you host it and in the way that you use it. We have fully containerized the application. It is a monolithic container. Uh, we will be releasing Helm charts for folks who are using Kubernetes clusters. Uh, we've added support for Postgres as a back-end database to give you guys more flexibility in the way that you deploy and deliver uh, decisions. Also to give us a lot more flexibility in the way we host it for you in terms of providing uh, scalability and on-demand scale. In 2023, we're swinging back from that kind of infrastructure uh, uh, perspective and we're focused a lot more on functions and features bringing you specifically Projects View, which I've just shown you, the deployment server, and a number of designer updates. This is our intelligent process automation reference. We're working constantly on our process mining tools and on the core automation tools, on the rule engine, the workflow engine, uh, the integration capability. It, I, I like to talk about this. There's a number of things. If you have not been to the con service presentation, and, uh, like, please go. They talk a lot about the process mining tools. Uh, I think we're making a lot of advances in the way that our, our process mining and our automation platform work together to give you insights. We've got a number of new features being released over the course of the next couple of months uh, that I think are really exciting. We, our process mining tools will now automatically start to look at flows and processes that you have running that have a lot of assignments and state and send you scheduled updates so that you can know what's going on in your processes. You know, this week over last week, things are taking longer. Uh, last week, things were happening at, in, in an hour at this approval step, and now it's taking three hours. Something must have changed. You need to get in there, get involved, and write some new rules. When we look at the automation development lifecycle, analyze, automate, execute, and elevate, we're spending a lot of time this year on that deployment column, right? Uh, whether or not it's, it's the infrastructure side of the deployment or it's the design side of the deployment, we're spending a lot of time this year on that deployment column, trying to make the product... Uh, easier for you to use at scale, easier for you to use across a large number of projects. We've got this confidence scorecard we love to show people because we like to talk about how much of our development is driven uh, by customer need and customer desire. We have big initiatives, right? Projects is a big initiative, but it, our average number of, of dev work, right? Units of, of dev work or tickets that our dev team accomplishes release over release is around 150 items. Okay, some of that is research and development, some of that is new initiatives, some of those are customer requests that you've submitted, some of those are new integrations like that chat GPT module that Gordon so pumped about yesterday. Uh, that said, 150 units of work, right, per release. That said, last year, we released 19 releases. So consistently, 
getting that work into your hands, consistently making the updates and the changes in the platform available to you as quickly as we can. We released 19 releases last year. Nine of those were in version 8X. Five of those were in version 7X. So you know, continuing to innovate on the, the newest version and allowing the older version to kind of slowly become stable and, and go into a bit of a maintenance mode is what you see through those numbers. We have a, a number of ways that you can be involved. If you want to see you know, that, percent of develop, uh, that percent of development that's intended directly for customers, that's planned development that, that is based entirely on your feedback and your input, and you want to have a voice uh, in the direction of the product, please join our, our product advisory team. Eric Walmerink, raise your hand, man. Stand up. There's Eric Walmerink. If you don't know Eric, yeah. Eric Walmerank runs the product advisory team. If you'd like to be on it, please approach him today. Uh, we would love to have you on there. We'd love to have your input. We'd love to showcase new features for you and get your advice about how to produce those. Version 8, let's talk a little bit about some of the capability changes we have in version 8. Uh, hosting in containers, I mentioned. We have a number of customers here who are hosted in containers uh, on-prem. You have taken decisions and you're hosting it in a containerized environment. Uh, our production environments, we're moving toward hosting exclusively in containers. We've had a huge number of updates to the truth tables. If you uh, have not used truth tables lately and you're a heavy rule user, you need to spend some time with one of these guys on the product engineering team and look at the new features that are available in truth tables. We've merged a lot of the capability that you had uh, in things like uh, matrix rules or uh, a rule table. We had all kinds of different types of table designers. We've merged a lot of that capability into truth tables so that you can have one way to produce uh, those, those actuarial kind of table looking rules and, and do it really, really consistently, consistently with a lot of flexibility. So the truth table updates in version eight are awesome. If you haven't used them again, please grab one of those guys and talk to them. We've added a lot of cloud logging uh, plugins for folks that want to manage their logging in a different way. Uh, we've combined our form styles. We're trying to make, uh, if you've used simple forms, you know we're pushing everything in a direction of a more uh, simplified, more Google Forms-esque type of form designer where everything is laid out vertically. We've merged a lot of the form capability from the traditional form designer into that simple form designer. And so you've got all of the sophistication you need with things like data grids and repeaters, uh, but in a much simpler layout mechanism. Our process mining tool is, uh, is constantly advancing. Uh, I mentioned the scheduled report that we have. We also have a new insights capability in process mining I've got a screenshot of here in a couple of, in a couple of slides I'd love to show you. Uh, we've made improvements to multi-tenancy in version eight, uh, bringing back the multi-tenant control panel making it a lot easier for those of you who host really complicated environments to spin up, spin down, and manage your tenants. A number of uh, improvements on the report viewer, and then a whole new system for archiving data and getting old data out of your transactional database to protect performance. I'm gonna go over some of our initiatives and our release plan. Our initiatives really this year are centered around three core concepts. That's the organization and deployment, right? I've already shown you that, so I don't need to beat that horse to death a bunch of designer enhancements. Uh, designer enhancements overlaying information right in the flow designer, right in the rule designer to help you make better choices when you're in there designing. Uh, also giving it a, a facelift, an update, and moving some of the underlying technology over to React so that we can make it more performant and we can make it more responsive. And then some product streamlining. And this is where I have an ask for you. Uh, one of the things that we really want to do with product streamlining is take all of the work that we've done over the last 12 years and identify the pieces and the parts of the product that make the biggest impact to your business and, and start to move some of the noise and some of the older features and the things that people aren't making use of out of the product and out of your way. In order to do that, uh, we need to know what people are using. So we've got a number of tools we'd like to bring to bear uh, in, in terms of assessing and surveying environments. Uh, we would love to both use in upgrade quality assurance testing and in looking at how we can streamline the product, we would love to use like development environments that you have. If you're interested in partnering with us and letting us have access to a development environment or a backup of a development database, would you please let Eric Wilmerink know? I'm gonna try to overwhelm him through this presentation. Just go to Eric, everybody go to Eric right after we break. But that's something where we could really use your partnership. We'd love to apply those tools to your environments, know exactly how and what you're using in the rule engine and in the flow engine, what you're using in the portal, so that we can make great choices about streamlining the product to make it easier and easier and easier to use. 
In the vein of those three primary initiatives, you see Projects View, I've just given you a sneak preview. Project View is really all about the organization and the scope of the project, the health of the project, and, and giving you visibility into the things that are going into the project without distracting you. Deployment Server is all about reimagining the way that we deploy those projects. In Decisions, one of the things I think we did a long time ago is, is we got so focused on the designer user's experience. We're all about that flow engine and rule engine. We always have been, right? But we were so focused on that experience that we kind of assumed the people doing a deployment and pushing that rule or pushing that flow into production was a designer user. And I think in most of your environments, that's not really common. You have some kind of DevOps team or IT ops team that's responsible for deployments and code pushes. And so we're reimagining the entirety of the deployment process through a deployment server with a focus on that user, on the DevOps, on the IT ops user giving them clarity around a package, giving them clarity around how to confirm and check health, giving them the opportunity to run tests and validate the, the integrity of the environment after a deployment. That's what Deployment Server is all about, and that'll be coming out very late this year. And then, of course, a designer, uh, designer refresh and the ability to do some uh, new theming in the product. Some of the initiatives you want to see in detail up here, if you have any questions about these, you can ask me. You can ask uh, Eric Walmerank, of course. But these, this is the way we present our product roadmap. Now is this quarter, next is next quarter, and then later is beyond that. We don't, we don't try to get too pinned down much beyond next quarter. But you can see the initiatives that we have on this list and you can see the stage that they're in. Some of these are in design, some of these are in development. And if you see something that is in development with a confidence level of high, that means it's going to be delivered, uh, it's going to be delivered in the next couple of months. We're very close. If you see something that's in design, maybe, like read-only designers with a confidence of medium, we think we will complete the design phase for that initiative uh, within the next month or so, but we're not quite as confident as we are about the delivery of projects view. Read-only designer is a, is a key feature of the deployment server. Being able to open, look at, review, and provide comments on a, a rule without being able to make changes at all is a security concern. It's an audit concern. It's a deployment concern. Uh, if you look at our Linux performance improvements, as we've moved into containers, running in the Linux operating system at the, with, with absolute performance parity to our Windows environments is key for us. That's something we've been working on a lot, and that's in testing. It's past development. Process mining automatic insights I've mentioned. I'm going to show you a screenshot of it. And then a uh, new system administration dashboard is still in design, but we've been so focused on the, on the initiatives above, we're kind of losing confidence that we'll get that done in the next two months. So if the system administration dashboard is something that's it's important to you or it's key to you, you should go tell Eric right after we break. Next, we're going to get into a page model redesign. We're actually merging the way that forms and pages work to kind of give you one design experience. The two are so very similar, we really want them to just behave as one. And all the features and capabilities that you've come to expect in the form designer ought to be available in that dashboarding capability with a lot less effort. And so that's something we're working hard to do along with the flow designer refresh. Our rule edit designer refresh is about giving you a more simplified rule experience that allows you to, to build and kind of craft a taxonomy so you could hand some rule configuration duties off to maybe a, a user who isn't as trained in the tool, doesn't have the same level of sophistication as the folks who would come to decisions days in the designer environment. Our toolbox searchability, uh, I mentioned we had a dev summit this past week. We had all the engineers together and one of the things that we did is we broke into teams of four and just worked on a feature that that particular team was excited about. Uh, toolbox searchability was in discovery when we put this slide presentation together for Decisions Days, but last week uh, we made huge tracks on it. And I actually think within the next release or two, uh, we'll be able to roll out a massive improvement to toolbox searchability, thanks in large part to Dr. Rafael Conforti back there. So Roth, raise your hand, you get, you get credit. Thank you, Roth. <laughs> Rule and user audit updates, Project View theme editor, allowing you to create a theme per project and a very simple uh, user interface to kind of select all your styles and, and apply that only to all of the elements and, and artifacts in that one project. Uh, defo default portal styling, proper task delegation, a, a redesign of the rule set system, some improved PDF functionality we're working on actually uh, with a partner, and schema-based multi-tenancy are all coming much later. Decisions in AI. Gordon forced me to have an AI slide. 
you guys all know from yesterday that Gordon is really, really excited about uh, AI and generative AI and large language models. I, I haven't been. Uh, I'm the cynic on the team, and I'm the Luddite on the team. I'm the old man on the lawn standing there uh, declaring that we know how this ends and we shouldn't give all of our, uh, all of our information over to the AI or it's going to eat us. Okay, I'm one of those guys. But what got me really excited is, you know, is, is thinking about Decisions Days and thinking about those of you who are coming and, and, again, just trying to think about what content we can provide to you that is helpful to you and that makes your jobs easier. I, I realized when Gordon said it to me, I, he was exactly right, that a lot of you people who are coming to Decisions Days, you have a mandate from your management. What are we doing with generative AI? What are we do how are we going to capitalize on something like ChatGPT in our environment? And so suddenly the idea of having a chat GPT module in decisions that's available to you made a ton of sense to me. Rather than try to figure out how we could make decisions better using generative AI and add some whiz-bang feature that makes one designer user's experience better, which we'll do, it's up there, V9 and beyond, we'll, we'll do that, right? Was creating a module where you could answer that question to your leadership. Here's what I can do. Decisions added a chat GPT module. So now I can make uh, ChatGPT available to the whole marketing team. I'll create a workflow catalog option. I'll allow the marketing team to submit requests to ChatGPT, but I'll constrain and control all the API calls through decisions. I'll add approval steps and I'll add business rules that provide governance. And so your ability to think about the ways you could take ChatGPT and make it available to your organization with all of the business logic, all of the governance, and all of the approvals that's available in decisions, it got me almost as excited as Gordon which is why we put the ChatGPT module together and decided to have, even though it felt a little gimmicky, uh, the ChatGPT Creators Cup today. So come back here this afternoon and we'll review uh, what some of you have done and we'll award a cash prize and the ridiculous trophy cup uh, to whoever has the best implementation and the one that excites us the most. Now that that's released and now that you have access to it, I can't wait to see what you guys do. We're gonna take uh, next steps Right? We're going to look at ways that we can use that to empower the designer user or empower the end user. Uh, we've got a, a great partner in Aldrich Capital Partners, our private equity group, and they brought together uh, all of the CTOs from across the portfolio to, get, to let everybody brainstorm together and get good ideas. And some of, our, uh, some of the fellow companies we have in the portfolio are doing some really clever things. Uh, and I'll just give you a couple of examples. The test data generation uh, test data generation example that Blake and, um, and Derek and Venetia showed you yesterday, that came from that summit. It's just a great idea to generate test data that you could use to test and vet business rules. Another really good idea we saw over there uh, was the idea of maybe using generative AI to help produce report filters. Report filters can get really complicated. The way you want to see report data about a flow or about assignments that you have in the environment, it can get really complicated to know how to put all of that together. What if you could just ask, have a dialogue, right, and say, I'd really like to see all of the tickets that have been touched by Corey Anderson in the last two weeks that Tim Wilde has never seen. And it'll say, oh, okay, well, let me put all that together. It's this really complicated SQL statement, and I can run it in the background. So we will be looking at enhancing the product using generative AI to make your lives easier. But I'm most excited about that first step, giving you the ability to kind of answer how you could take generative AI and make use of it safely in your organization. Our long-term roadmap, continued work on containerization. I've talked a lot about Project View and deployment server, uh, continued adoption of AI, client-side execution of rules, something a lot, of, a lot of you have asked for, especially people who heavily use uh, the user interface, who heavily use the forms, who heavily use the dashboarding. Uh, we'd like to improve the client-side execution and the, and the weight of that client uh, experience. Additional integrations, we're always adding additional integrations, 150 items of dev work done per release. We're always adding new integrations. We're always adding small things to the product to, to make it better. Uh, and then ultimately getting to some things that we're excited about like native NoSQL data storage uh, and, and potentially a new microservice, uh, true microservice implementation. However, like, I don't know if a lot of you read uh, what's in the news lately, but there's been a lot of uh, people swinging back from true microservice architecture to monolithic architecture, excuse me, because of the problem of managing all the dependencies between their services. It's been really interesting reading lately. So we'll see. We've got that in the well beyond column. A couple of screenshots and I'll let you go. Process mining insights, something I'm really excited about. You, you take the process mining tool. If you don't currently use our process mining tool and you're on version eight, 
right? Those guys at that back table would love to help you get started with the process mining tools. You point it at your database, you point it at your projects, and you start to get insights. Where are the bottlenecks? Where are things held up? Where are there big opportunities for efficiency? And now there's a brain icon at the top right that you can hit, and it's gonna propose insights for you. It's gonna take a look at that data, and it's gonna try to analyze some of it for you and say, you know what? Most of your time is spent in deployment here, and have you considered? Might you want to change something about this process where you'll get the biggest bang for the buck? You'll get the most impact. Mobile portal updates. We've been making a lot of changes to the mobile portal uh, to make the mobile experience a lot easier, a lot more natural. Uh, so the mobile portal has actually undergone a, a, a pretty substantial rewrite in the last several months, last six or so months, uh, led by Sam Jones over there. Sam, thank you very much, appreciate it. And uh, we've, so if you haven't used the mobile portal in a long time, you, you should check it out. If you use the workflow catalog, if you use assignments in decisions, the mobile portal has made massive advances. Project view I've already shown you, so I'm not gonna bore you guys with a lot of these slides. We're gonna skip through it and I'll let you go. And then we've got some of the early designs here of the deployment server concept. So being able to take and see uh, the health of a deployed project, being able to look at the artifacts that are being pushed uh, to an environment in the deployment server view. And I think there's one more screenshot of deployment server here, creating a package for a DevOps user, setting a version and a revision and giving them an explanation. And then we've got some early screenshots of some new uh, flow designer features that are coming with regard to visualizing data and visualizing performance data and then visualizing process mining data right in the flow design environment. So that's really it. Uh, that's a pretty standard product roadmap review. We do these product roadmap reviews every Thursday if you would like to come, please just let your CSM know, let your sales rep know. Uh, in, in a pinch, if you're not sure who to talk to, you can go talk to Eric Wilmerink in the back there. We have that product advisory team. The, the ask I have for you is I'd love for you to be involved. I would love for you to get involved on in the product advisory team, join us, uh, get your input into the product team early and often. And again, my main ask for you is that if you're interested in allowing us to partner with you and look at your dev environment, uh, get data from your dev environment to help us make some choices about uh, the future of the product and product streamlining, we would love to do that. Just contact me or contact Eric Wilmerink. Don't forget today, we have the Live Lunch and Learn at noon that's gonna be in here where we reproduce a lunch and learn experience, which is something that we offer as a, as a service to you, the customer. Uh, we're gonna do a demo version of that in here with you guys uh, today. We've got uh, Will Pedersen doing sessions on containers. Uh, we've got, I, I believe we have, um, I don't know what else is on the schedule. That's as far as I can go, I think, is those two things. But with that, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for being here to spend time with us. It is what makes these events special, and I hope you have an absolutely awesome day.